<laughs> right, where's my mouse here? Here we go. Good morning, guys. Um, I hope you're all well this morning. We're going to uh, just give you a couple of minutes to get yourselves in, connected and settled down. If you want to say hello, please do select all panellists and attendees so that everybody can see that you're here. It's always nice to hear from you. I'm dreading we Mr Glasgow appearing on here. <laughs> we <laughs> know Mr Glasgow will be there. I've already had a picture this morning. Oh, I have too. Yeah, you had the same oh, one. Yeah, oh, I'm he's here. Yeah, he's here. I'm, scar I'm scarred. Oh. I'm, I'm trying to get it out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the best way to start the day, was it? No, at least he had at least he had socks on. That's all. Yeah, at least he had. Oh, socks on. Dear, 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 dear. oh gosh! <laughs> oh, he's here. He's here. He's gonna he's gonna bombard us. <laughs> from the Philippines. Wow. Oh wow. Devon. Wow. <laughs> Just one sock is the worry shot from Steve Stewart. <laughs> It's one of those little trainer socks as well, isn't it? Small. <laughs> the less said about that, the better, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I can't believe we've not really got to just got live and we're down in the gutter already. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Lee. The presence of Mr. Glasgow <laughs> as ever. <laughs> right then, guys. Um if you I'm gonna post a link when the when the chat calms down i'm going to post a link and if you'd like to um contribute and say thank you sean's given us a link to a charity that he's supporting which i'm sure we'll touch on during the session and um, so if you'd like to say thank you that's a way of doing so um i'm going to hand over to the very capable gavin to uh, and sean welcome to webinars thank Brilliant. you thank you good morning everybody um as you can see we've got the <laughs> Mr. Sean took her with us this morning, which is a privilege, Sean. I think we met um, a couple of years ago in Hull at, yeah. at HIP. Yeah. And you were presenting a few a few chats there that sort of, if I remember right, they sort of they overran a little bit, didn't they? Because people were so interested in, in what you had to say and things like that. Or, or I'm too long-winded. Yeah, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one or the other. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, I remember sitting there just thinking, well, this guy talks so much sense. So <laughs> um, we'll see if we can kill that myth. To, to yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure we're sort of that. So, I mean, we, we spoke briefly yesterday just to go through the software and things. So, I mean, let's start at the beginning. Africa, let's start there, shall we? And um, you know, where you lived and brought up, was it? Yeah, um, uh, I was born in the UK, but um, glamorously in Hemel Hempstead, just outside London, um, <laughs> lovely yeah, part of the world. I can't really comment. <laughs> no, 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 best not. Um, <laughs> when I was about uh, six months old, my, um, my family moved out to Zimbabwe. Uh, my dad uh, was part of a German company that built factories out there. Uh, and we lived there for about four years, and then my parents got divorced, and my mom brought my brother and I, who was, who'd just been born, we came back to the UK and lived in uh, just outside Bath for about three years here. And then my mom just missed Africa. So she wanted to go back. So she took the two of us uh, and we went over to live in Botswana in a little place called Salibi Pikwi, which is on, almost on the border with um, Zimbabwe. And she ended up uh, cooking food at a, a, a kind of hotel slash restaurant there. And, um, we were there about a year and she met the local Barclays bank manager and they, uh, they fell in love and then she got remarried. And then it was basically three years in a post because he was a, he was a, you know, an expat bank manager. So you get kind of get moved around. So we came back to the UK, lived in Devon for a year, but then we were back out to uh, Lesotho for four years, Swaziland for four years. And then I moved to South Africa to do schooling and then study at university and the rest of it. So yeah, most of my most of my upbringing was was Africa, like various countries in southern Africa. So um, you know, obviously, you, you know, it's quite well known that you started in the church mm -hmm. uh, and then came into photography. So when did mm. they, what was the the lure away from the church to photography? Well, it wasn't a lure. I was fired for a couple of times <laughs> because I was a it was less less of a lure and more please leave. Because uh, I, was, I was saying things they didn't really like. So, I mean, I, I kind of knew when I went in to study um, theology that 
even those first years in seminary, I knew like, I'm not going to be able to do this long term because there's a lot of stuff here I really, really don't agree with. But in South Africa, for me, it was a lot to do with um, uh, kids and youth ministry and young adults. So my, my purview was always sort of uh, kids up to sort of 35 years old. Um, and uh, we did a lot of kind of poverty outreach stuff in Africa as well, in South Africa, which, which I absolutely loved and had a lot of time for that. But none of the politics and I really didn't get on with the kind of very literal interpretation of stuff. And, and, and I, I never kind of towed the line and, and I started sort of speaking out against a lot of that. And especially at the last church I worked at, um, the one I was fired from, they, uh, they were quite a wealthy church in Cape town and, um, you know, would take it. I don't know if you know the system with churches, you take in tithes, you take in 10% of everyone's salary. Basically they, they volunteer to give you 10%. That's how they keep themselves going. But they then use that money to, to build bigger buildings and they were buying up all the houses on the block and they, they started installing uh, metal spikes outside the door of the church to keep homeless people from sleeping there. And, and, and this was at a time where we had very serious xenophobic attacks in South Africa and there's a lot of poverty issues. We had soup kitchens and we, we bus homeless people in to come to church. And we got told we couldn't do that because stuff would get messed up. And I just started saying, this is, this is bullshit guys. Why are we, why are we, well, it, it, like even from what we say we believe this is nothing to do with it so I was basically told to shut up or I would get kicked out and I said well I'm, you're going to have to kick me out because I'm not going to stop so that basically goes against everything the church supposedly stands for isn't it? Supposedly, supposedly I just don't think a lot of them read their bibles I think it's more like uh, it's more like they sort of cherry pick the parts and make them feel a bit superior to everyone else like you know um, uh, you know we're, we're great gay people aren't that great kind of bullshit and I, I just didn't have any time for it because I think it was again like this is this is one of the reasons it would never have worked because I I insisted that um like reading the bible literally is a terrible way to read it I mean it's a it's a it's a collection of books from a few thousand years ago we're getting controversial already um, <laughs> and like, can you and me and you uh, controversial yeah who would have thought <laughs> um, um and uh, and I just don't. I think the, the the literal way to apply stuff is always the lowest form of meaning. There's still such value in a book like that, and there's such value in pursuing spirituality of yourself. But when you try to lock it down and put it in boxes, and then treat anyone else like crap in its name, you've lost the plot by a long way. So, I mean, I I knew that from early on that it wasn't going to last. I kind of just towed the line and tried to push the boundaries a little bit where I could, and then. Um, yeah, I got fired a couple of times for, for saying things they didn't like. And the last time I just, um, I was, I just turned 30 and it was, it was, it was at a point where I was like, well, you know, I've, I've sunk 10 years into doing this thing well, or being able to do this thing well, and I have to start from scratch now. And a, and a friend had said to me, well, um, you really love photography. And I'd already been working in video on the side of church as well. So I thought, well, what if I could make that my job? And that was kind of the jump. Um, did you start in video and then go to stills then? So you were filming yeah. before stills? Yeah, it's, that started because I was running youth camps in uh, just outside Johannesburg in South Africa. And um, I, uh, I, it was at the time, early 2000s, when Survivor was big on TV, if you remember Survivor, the reality show. And was so that, what we came... That wasn't the one about the nuclear blast, was it? No, 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 no. That's what okay. we like. They they strand two tribes on an island, and you have to do challenges against each oh, other, okay. and you get voted out and all that. Yeah, so that was Survivor, um, and uh, it was big on TV at the time. So we decided we would do these Survivor style weekends, and we'd you know get kids in, and we'd split them into tribes and give them challenges. And I filmed the whole weekend, and then we'd cut the the the, the weekend together in a in like a one hour Survivor episode style with kind of ripping off their branding and their music and all the rest of it and then we'd sell the dvds to the kids as a mentor of the weekend so that's how i started years before and then i got picked up by a group called heartlines um which was um this is while i was working for the church nelson mandela uh commissioned um eight one hour films to be made that went out on tv on sunday nights for eight weeks in a row and they were about um, qualities he wanted to see in the population, things like forgiveness and acceptance and all these kind of things. So each, each film focused on a theme and it was kind of a narrative. So I, I wasn't involved in the making of those films, but they picked me up as part of this road show that went around the country for a month to promote these films. So I ran the multimedia screens and did filming around those. So that was kind of a thing I was doing on the side of the church work stuff as well. 
And then I just got into doing little corporate jobs on the side to kind of make ends meet because the church doesn't pay very well. So I was sort of uh, having to kind of uh, pay the bills other ways as well. And so, you know, I did uh, promotional videos for, for brands. I did um, like training video. I did a training video for an abattoir once, which was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine what that was like. Which was, yeah, eye-opening. And then, uh, yeah, all, just anything I could do to kind of get work in. So, and photography was always going, but it was never anything I, I, I made money off. It was always the video stuff that, that, that paid the bills. And then, yeah, after kind of I left the church at the end there, it was, well, maybe I could make this my job. If I have to start, that was the great thing. It's like, I have no choice. I have to start literally from the beginning. It has to be something totally different, whatever I do next. So the good part of that was I could choose absolutely anything. So I thought, why not give it a go? We've got some pictures from Africa. Are these mm. part of, um, I'll just share my screen. Are these parts, where, where were these? Are they after you've been, been back or before? Or let me just have a look at these. Here we are. Oh, let me just move this there. <clears throat> oh, okay. Yeah, so these are, these are actually from a few years ago. This is since I've been back in the UK. I went back. Uh, to um, Namibia, which is a country on the southwest coast of uh, Africa, beautiful country uh, with uh, one of the oldest, you know, longest continuous deserts in the world. And it's it's the, there's some amazing people there called the Himba. So I, I decided I would go and do a portrait project uh, with the Himba tribe um, in Namibia. And this was a this was just a personal thing for me because I was trying to work. I'm actually working on a video on this on the moment, which will come out probably next weekend. Um, about how I could build a bit more meaning into my portrait work because up until then, I think portrait's always been a first love for me when it comes to photography. And I, I had done a lot of what everyone does, I think, when they try and build their skill set, which is you get on websites like Model Mayhem and Purple Port and try and find models and actors who just need headshots and they're willing to give you their time for free and you'll give them your time for free as a photographer. You both get to use the images in your own portfolios and you build your skill set and you build your portfolio. So I'd done a lot of that, but I was kind of getting tired of, of uh, shooting, you know, um, just attractive looking people trying to look sexy is the most brutal way I could put that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it just <laughs> felt like I, I know how to do that and they know how to do that. And there wasn't as much of a challenge in it anymore. And my, my portfolio, was starting to look like a model portfolio. And that's not, I don't mind doing that sort of work. I really enjoy it, but I didn't want that to be what my portfolio said that I did. I wanted to have more uh, depth in the, in, and story in, in the portraits that I was taking. So my heroes are people like Steve McCurry and Sebastian Salgado and uh, Jimmy Nelson and some of the um, personal work that people like Joey L does in tribes around the world as well. And I thought maybe the thing to do is to, to put myself on a plane and to, to fly out there and to, and to actually see if I can take some portraits with people who don't look like me, who have a different story to me, have a different worldview, different culture, and see if something about changing the subject in front of the camera makes the images different and teaches me something. Yeah, so this was a, this was a really great trip. I enjoyed it, yeah. What do you think is the most important thing in a portrait? Like, I mean, the, a lot of photographers differ on, um, on the, what they think is the principal point of a portrait now i know i have my opinions i mean some photographers think it's about light some people think it's yeah. posing and all this sort of thing what what what's your your thoughts on this one for the sort of portrait it's, it's different for everybody so i don't want to i don't want to put something out that's like you know this is the way to do it but when it comes to me i want i want to catch an unguarded moment that's the important thing for me i want to catch and it's very hard to talk about this without sounding super wooey or like nebulous. So I'll try, but I'll probably mess it up. But I think <laughs> there's a moment in any portrait shoot where you, where someone drops their guard and lets you see who they actually are. And if you catch that moment, um, that's what I'm after in a portrait. So that it's, it's funny because when you shoot, I, I know you shoot a lot of um, sort of models as well. And, I think when you shoot a model or especially an actor, because they're so aware of how they look and they know how to hold themselves, it's, it's harder, much harder to get an honest moment from them because when they come in, they, they, they're going to run through their poses. They're going to run through um, their, their looks, their expressions that they know how to give a camera and they know work well, work well on camera. So you're not getting them. You're getting the, 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 the person that they want to portray on, on, on that uh, shot. So 
I, like little tricks I'd sometimes use is like, you know, just setting up the lights and saying, look, I'm just doing test shots. You can just relax from now. And I'd be shooting that whole time. And some of those early shots, I might get something interesting. But um, once they settle in, it's very hard to kind of get them out of that. Mm. And you try and do it with conversations and sort of drawing them out, but get them out of that to a moment that's genuine. And I, I would find that when I took portraits with people and I get that honest glimpse, that chink in the armor, uh, you know, they, pe people would often look at that image and go, oh, well, that's, that's an interesting one, but they, they wouldn't like it. They wouldn't, they wouldn't want it. And I, I would have to sort of talk them into, I'm like, trust me, this, this was an honest moment from you. Like I got a little glimpse of who you are in that moment. Show this to your friends and family and see what they think. And invariably speaking, they take that back and friends and family go, this is you. This is great. This is who you are. I know you like it when you look like that, but this is you. So it's always trying to kind of cut through the, the, the psychological armor and the poses and the, and the look. And this is why shooting with these guys was amazing with the Himba because they just didn't have that. They literally just, they literally just stood there and stared me down, which was, and it was so open. It felt so totally different. And, and I didn't have, the other funny thing about this trip is like, I didn't have the ability to do a shoot with each person. So the, the way I approached it, because I didn't want to walk in and sort of be too pushy. It was my first time doing it. I didn't want to, you know, get in everyone's faces. So what I said to my, I had a fixer and I said, to, who was from the tribe. And I said to her, listen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up on the side over here. And if people would like photographs, they can come over and get photographs and then I'll take them and I'm going to print them and send them back to the village, which I did. So they volunteered and came over and I shot with them off to the side. That's the way I wanted to do it rather than walk in and just get in everyone's faces. We've, um, we've had a question on this actually, but I think you've, you've just answered it. Actually. Right, right, right. Um, the question is, how your portraits went in other countries and cultures of local people in their <coughs> natural settings, or are they of local people in their natural settings, or do you, like McCurry, um, sometimes use actors and models to create scenes that look natural in the setting? No, no, these, these, are, these are, no, I don't, I'm not dressing anyone up. <laughs> this, is, this, is the, this is the Himba tribe, this is their traditional dress, yeah, and this is the people who live in that village, yeah. Um, and, I think uh, it's actually obvious, to be honest, by looking at the pictures. Yeah, 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 I mean, I, I mean, yeah, you'd have to go to a lot of a lot of hassle to do that every day. I think, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and I, I because because like they didn't really understand the concept of a photo shoot. Um, I, I, they basically walked in. I sort of stood them kind of where I wanted. I wait till they looked at me. I took a shot, and after that first shot, they just walked away. So I had one shot with everybody because they didn't. They, I'm not going to go. Oh no, hold on, and move this and pose. There wasn't any of that. It was literally just stand, and I just looked at them and sort of chatted to my chatted to them through the translator and I waited for them. I just took one shot and they walked off straight away because they had a photograph. That's what they understood. Mm -hmm. So I had to get it first time every time, but they made it very easy because they literally just engaged. Like it was, it was different to, there wasn't this kind of, I think sometimes when we, you know, living in a big city like London, you know, where we do, I think there's a lot of insecurity in people in, in big cities that it, you don't find in, in, in poorer, more rural parts of the world where life's a lot simpler. There's a lot more open engagement there. And, and that was quite eye-opening for me. I thought it was yeah. quite interesting to see, yeah. Well, I think you've lit a few of these pictures as well, haven't you? I mean, how did they react yeah. to that? It was, it was funny, because, yeah, it was fine. I mean, they, they knew what I'd do is anyone who came, I would sort of, I'd sort of point to the light and show them. And because the trigger was on top of my camera, I'd say, look, it's gonna, it's gonna flash and I'd get the person to explain. And I triggered the flash once so they could see what it did. Um, and the, apparently the kids were running around like saying, oh, he's, he's you know, he's, he's, it's like lightning. It's like lightning, you know, like Parano, <laughs> because in their, in their language, you know, but like, yeah, I, I made sure to explain it every time that this thing was going to pop. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, I wanted to do that kind of mix of strobe and ambience on, a, on some of them and sort of create a bit more, a bit more drama and backlight it. Like you can see the one that's on screen now is obviously, backlit with the with the sunset off to the right after the over the right shoulder on that side and then and then i've got on the right side here in in the foreground i've got a i think it was an alien v800 with a it's it's called a soft lighter it's basically an umbrella you shoot into that bounces back but there's a piece of diffusion material before it comes back so it's yeah. just a big soft box but it sort of folds like an umbrella easy to so travel with as well i should think yeah, although, I mean, yeah, I've got a much smaller kit now. That was an Alien V, so it was a flash head with a, a, a battery pack as well that had to get jacked in. Now I use, I'll show you if you're interested. Hold on, it's behind my couch here. We're going to find out what's behind Sean's couch. That's something you've every day. Yeah. 
yeah, this is like my, my studio is behind my couch. This is, a, this is what I use now, and I wish I had these then because they are just so travel friendly, are these little um, Godox 8200s. Yeah. And I could have done the whole shoot with this instead of like a big flash head and a big battery pack because they high speed sync. So even though it's not as powerful as that, I can shoot up to, I don't know, 4,000th of a second and this thing will still sync. So I could kill the ambient light by speeding up the shutter speed mm. and still bomb some flash in just with something I could fit almost in a pocket. It's just like a chunky speed light. And this is pretty much three speed lights <clears> worth <throat> of power. In this. So when, when it's golden now, it's plenty. Technology's moved on so far yeah. with, with, with light, hasn't it? And, it's and crazy. Yeah. Portable light, you know, I, and, and manufacturers, you know, all selling you their lights better than the other light. But to be honest, light's light and it may be a little bit more kiss yeah. consistent. There might be a few bits and pieces and tweaks and bells and whistles but at the end of the day a light is a light and it's where you put it in it that's that makes all the difference do you use yeah. do you i mean one of the questions a lot of photographers get asked is are you a natural light shooter or are you a, uh, a strobe light shooter and uh, do you have a preference um i'm both really I, d I don't think i have a preference it depends on the it depends on the shoot and what i'm trying to do um uh, if, if I do shoot with strobe outdoors, I still want it to feel as natural as possible. I mean, I'm looking at these and uh, I was pushing it quite hard here. You, you, I, I would keep it softer and, and less now if I did that. I'd, I'd have a slightly bigger, softer light source and have the power slightly lower to balance it a bit better. Because I think if you, the best lighting when you use it outdoors is invisible. It just, oh, I you, totally you, agree. Yeah. you make it look like you just got really lucky with the light and people have to question whether it's lit, I think is great, which these are obviously lit, but, but I, I, now I would do it a lot more subtly, but yeah, I mean, if, if sometimes the light is so beautiful, it, it kind of, it kind of ruins it to, to, to add something to it as well. So it really depends on the, the context or what I'm trying to accomplish really. Yeah. And you decided on color because I know you're, a, do you have a yeah. color and black and white? Are you, a, I mean, no. honestly, I'm, I'm very black and white. <laughs> yeah. In many ways. Um, in many ways, yeah. <laughs> in many ways, yeah. But, uh, you know, my black and white work is what I'm known for, and that comes from my mm. old film shooting days. So, I mean, I know you're a film shooter as well, but did you just decide that this is going to be colour, this project? Yeah, I mean, this was an obvious choice because uh, because the, 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 the skin tones that, that you get with these images, and they also, the, the, the red clay they use for the dreadlocks is just such a shame to, you, to lose. Yeah. Um, that sort of rich, those rich earthy tones. I think they they make fine black and white images, but for me in this case, throwing the color away was a was a real shame. It, it makes a lot of the image. It, it it puts you in the place. Like you can see, kind of the red tones and the red stuff they smear on their skin. The um, color, it's kind of it, the color palette is 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 beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's the whole. And it, I I've never even tried to convert these into black and white because I can only imagine they'd lose something. Mm -hmm in the process so that for me this was an obvious choice this is definitely a color project yeah because you've uh, i mean i presume these i'm going to stop sharing this now you um i presume that you know these were shot with the dslr as well were they and you've you've changed uh, yeah to, to so that was that whole shoot was uh, I, I wanted to do uh it was a five canon 5d mark ii which was my workhorse cameras for years and uh, I did the whole shoot on one fixed focal prime because I wanted some consistency. So everything was shot there on the Sigma 50 mil art prime. You shot um, on the 50, did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 50 is kind of my go-to for, for portraits now. It used to be 85, but I, I, like, I like having that little bit of extra width. And I also like the fact that I can be a little bit closer to the subject. So having a conversation with someone, the way I, the way mm. I like to frame somebody at 50 mil feels like I'm at the right distance away from them to have a good conversation. Um, so that, that I think that's important actually is that, yeah. that working distance. Yes. Lots of people say, I love the depth of this lens. I love the way it throws backgrounds out mm -hmm. of focus. But for me, an 85, I mean, I've just gone to a 105 um, portrait mm. lens, but it's not increased the distance. That mm. working distance is so important, that connection distance. If you're miles away, it just alienates you from your, your viewer so obviously you but, feel the same way yeah my personal thing with that is like once you go past 85 for me it doesn't matter anymore because the background is going to be out of focus if you want it to be and it's just going to look you'd have to compare the differences in bokeh but it's just become texture and color so what does it matter now mm. you know what what it doesn't really matter that much if you're shooting someone in a 400 mil lens 
I mean, it, it, it starts to look a bit fake, you know, that like the background might be just color texture behind them. And I, I, especially when I'm shooting outdoors, I want context. So you can imagine in those shots where you can see the hut in the background or the fence of the crawl in the middle of the village, I would have lost that context if I shot that on a, on a yeah. 200 mil lens. I, I want them in situ. That's half the point of the, of the portraits. Otherwise, I would have just stuck them on a plain black background or something and shot them <laughs> like that, which is a legitimate choice, but that's not what I wanted. It's, it is about that working distance, yeah. Especially and, it's a location-based shoot. I mean, you, that's part of the, the whole, yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. thing, isn't it? You know, it's, you go yeah. there, why, as you say, they could be anywhere. There could be, there could be models in that case, couldn't they? You know, yes. against a black background. Yeah. I mean, I think there probably is some legs in doing a shoot like that. Sure. Um, but it'd be a very, very specific purpose of, yeah. uh, and, um, for doing that, you know. Yeah. I've got some more pictures up here, um, which I will share. And these are your studio-based mentor pictures. Um, oh yeah, okay, yeah. Which is a, a complete contrast from what we, what we've just looked at. Can everybody? Can you see that? Can everybody see that? Yeah, so that? yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the story with these is um, it actually it, it actually relates to the Namibia. Um, these are actually the ones printed behind me as well. I noticed. Um, these, uh, these were, off the back of the Namibia trip, I went to uh, an outfit here in London called Genesis Imaging, who are one of, the, one of the best printers of photography in the country. They print the Magnum guys and everything else. And I, I went to them and I made a, a little video with, with them about you know, the process of printing and why printing your images is such a great experience. And um, I remember like while I was, while these images were sort of running through the printer and we were doing test runs, I was with the sort of creative director there. And he said to me, I was kind of quite proud of the images I'd done on that Namibia trip. And he said to me, well, they're technically good pictures of really interesting looking people and I don't care about them at all. And I thought, wow, okay, so what, like, what did I do? What did I do wrong? And it took me a while to kind of unpack. And I realized it's, I didn't do anything wrong. It's just that, that, you could almost accuse what I was doing of cultural tourism. I'm, go I'm going and I'm finding really, really interesting people and I'm taking technically good photographs about them, but I'm not really telling a story. I'm relying on the, how interesting they are as people. And I am, um, you know, I, th I think you could take a bad photograph of them. People think it'd be good because the subject is so interesting, but I'm not really telling a story with it that's connected to me in any way. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. And I will absolutely do projects like the Namibia project again, but I knew it, it kind of said to me that there was more to be done. So these images you're looking at now came because I realized the next step in my portrait journey was going to be having to build meaning into my photography. So, and I, I tried to do something very simple. I took a flight back to South Africa. I found three men who for me were people who were very, because I grew up, my dad left when I was very, very young. And these men in my life, stepped in that gap at some point and helped me grow up and become a man at some point, how, how, to, how to navigate, you know, life. And, and they mean so much to me because of that. And so I thought, what if I go to them and I just pop up a, you know, little pop up black background. I use the AD200 with one light on a stand, super, super simple. You couldn't get more simple lighting in the world, just a Rembrandt light and took photographs of those mm. and see if they came across more powerfully. And for me, these are much stronger, more connected photographs because of my connection to them. And I think, I think, I mean, again, this is one of those wooey things you need to be careful of, but the feedback I've got is people can pick something like that up. And so this was kind of a step forward from Namibia for me. And even going into the future now, um, I know that I need to, if, if I want to take the most meaningful portrait I can, it has to be connected with me even loosely. I have to have some kind of skin in the game, some, some connection to a story I'm telling. And that's what they represent, really. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, people do overcomplicate and worry about, like, you know, one light. We've only got one sun when we shoot. You know, I think one light, and it's just, it's, as we said just it's earlier, it's, it's one light used well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Light source is irrelevant. It's if you want it hard, if you want it soft, you want character and again storyline to images and, and personal connection to images uh, i mean i judge with the guild um, mm. the personal connection is almost taken out of the loop in competition have you ever been yeah have you ever been driven by a competition is it something you've ever thought about no. i mean 
I think I'd it's stay, you, are stay clear. you are. Though. Are you, are you <laughs> an anti-competition photographic competition? No, no, no. no I think they, I think it's good to get feedback and stuff, and I think they can be useful. I just, I just, I'm not really a competitive person, so I've never, <laughs> I, yeah, never, never oh, been yeah. driven to do it. I mean, I used to light everything because I used to do product photography. You know, I'd be working in a studio with, with six or seven lights on one product on a given day and lighting became very very complicated and there, there was a phase where my portraits got very complicated and i was you know adding gels and three or four lights and all the rest of it and since then like i've just totally undone that stuff like now every um every portrait i do is 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 one light and on a rare occasion i'll add a second light but i like to keep it as simple as possible now because i think it it's more timeless you know, I mean, we, if we rely on the gimmicks, we can we could so quickly date something that we do. Oh, that that was trendy in 2012. But I actually, think it's, um, I think you know, as you, um, you know, one light is simple. It's honest. Mm. Uh, you know, the the rawness of a single light. Uh, the you know, you, you you do as you say, you distract. You know, you overcomplicate pictures. Mm. A light. Technically, I mean, does a, does I mean this is another ancient argument. Does a photograph technically have to be technically to have impact? And if you look at some of the most famous photographs we've got in the yeah. world, they're absolutely hugely flawed technically. But does that really matter? I mean, I don't think so. I, it, Annie Leibovitz is always my example for that because Annie Leibovitz is an amazing photographer, obviously. But my favorite work of hers will always be her on tour with the Rolling Stones and her shitty film camera that she was taking. And the images are out of focus or blurry or grungy or gritty and grainy. And, uh, but, the, but what she captured there by being in that space is technically not nearly as proficient as the Vanity Fair cover she shoots with a crew of 50 people and a whole room full of retouches. It's, it's, it doesn't touch it for technicality. Uh, but, but the meaning in those shots and what they convey for me is much more powerful and, and like she's got a portrait of her mother, um, which again, like isn't the most technically impressive shot. I think you give anyone, you give anyone a DSLR, stick it in auto and get them to stick it on 1.4 on, on, on aperture priority or something and just take the shot. You're gonna get something similar and throw it into black and white, but, but what a powerful shot. And it's, you know, her mother very open at an older age and the story behind it about how she was uncomfortable with the shot being taken. She felt she looked old and, and Annie's trying to talk into it, you look so beautiful in this, I can't believe how, how gracefully you've aged. I'm like, that's meaningful, photo it's not technical photography, mm -hmm. but holy crap, that's meaningful photography that really hits me somewhere, that, that yeah. really conveys something. Because photographers and, you know, I mean, forums and sometimes competitions, it, it gets, uh, it's exactly what we said, it becomes all about technique. And I think, I mean, I, I, th I think your photography go journey goes through kind of an arc where, at the beginning, and we all do it, I definitely did it, is you start by trying to pick up the best gear you can and work out which gives you the edge, which lens that gives you that tiny edge. And then you learn tips and tricks and stuff and techniques that will, that will, when you post those images, people aren't quite sure how you did it, so they're very impressed. And you do all that because it, it, they feel like a better photographer quickly. But there comes a stage where you realize all that stuff is style over substance. And you, you, you now got really stylish images that mean nothing and now you need to reverse engineer it a little bit and build back in the substance and that might mean you keep it as technical as you've learned that stuff might still be important to you and you keep it very technical but you build substances underneath but for me it was i'm going to chuck out most of the stuff i learned because i think it confuses the issue and work more on substance than what i'm trying to say and that means i shoot way simpler now than i ever did i know that stuff but it doesn't it doesn't help me tell a better story usually You've gone through, I think a lot of photographers and photography goes through the stage where you, you do fill your kit bag to the gunnels, don't you? Yeah. And then all of a sudden you start peeling everything back. And I yeah. find this when I go for a walk, I always usually have a camera slung in a bag somewhere. And I'll think, oh, I'll only use this one lens today. I don't take a bag full of gear. I'll think, well, I'll work with one lens because I think it makes you more proficient. It makes you look harder. Um, and the other thing I'll often do as well even with modern digital cameras where we can shoot, you know, thousands of pictures on the card, I limit set myself to 24 pictures. Right, it yeah. It takes you in an old roll of film. And it yeah. just makes you work that little bit harder. Yeah. You know. 
I mean, I, I sell a book of photography every year and, and 90% of the images in last year's book of, this year's book of photography was shot on this, on a, on a little Sorry. Ricoh GR point and shoot. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's now my most used camera. I mean, this fits in my pocket. So, so it, it just shows like it's not really, I mean, the sooner you can get out of that trap. I mean, I just know too many starter photographers who are, uh, photographers who are trying to put gear they can't afford on credit cards and sinking themselves into debt, thinking that's what makes the difference. And you absolutely need the right tool for the job, no question. So if you need an 85 mil lens, because that's how you like to shoot portraits, you need to get an 85 mil lens. But I shot my whole career on the, on the, on the little USM, the cheap 85 mil uh, from Canon. I've got the Sony cameras now for my studio stuff. I haven't bought any G Master lenses. I've got some Tamron lenses and I've got the cheap Sony primes, the 1.8, 1, 1. because I don't think it makes the difference, you know, and I'd hate to spend, I'd rather, I'd rather spend money on putting myself on a plane, going yeah. somewhere interesting to take photographs of interesting things than shell out thousands of quid on gear that makes tiny incremental differences that the average person will never see and care I mean, about. Modern lenses are a ridiculously sharp pieces of kit, mm. most of them. I mean, and some people, you know, me personally, I mean, I, I love sharp lenses, but then I'll end up taking the edge off pictures. So you think, well, yeah. What's the point? Well, What's you're a Sony point? guy, aren't you? Yeah. I've been, I've been I mean, they're, they're razor sharp. They're too sharp. I shoot on the Sigma art glass, you know. Right. Um, I have them because basically I've, my, a lot of my stuff still Canon based from when I was mm. Canon. But I find them absolutely razor sharp, wide open. Mm. And then you think, well, that's a, is, is it too sharp? Are these yeah. things actually taking, giving me too much information and, and killing what is the, the, the essence of what I'm trying to capture? Yeah. I think people get obsessed, they get obsessed with pixels. I totally understand it from a product point of view. Sure. If you're shooting sure. a product image, then obviously your client may want that picture massive. So you have to shoot on the, on the sure. big gear, you know, and, and the phases, phase ones mm -hmm. and, and all this sort of stuff, you know, which obviously costs more than your house these days. Um, yeah. So I get that, but the reality of, of going out and shooting portraits in the street, no, nah, does it really matter? No, I, no. I'm, I'm with you on that. I agree. I mean, the, mm. the classic statement is a, I can't remember who it was that said it, that the, the most important camera you've got is the one that's in your hand. Yeah. Whether Chase it, Jarvis, yeah. Yeah. I don't know who said that. I mean, we've got Lee, Lee's written a, a comment here, and it's a, it's a fairly civil one for Lee. Uh, Kevin mm -hmm. Mullins once quoted someone saying, a photograph doesn't have to be good, it has to be important. And I think I can agree with that statement. Mm. What do you think on that one? Well, well, I mean, Lee's a great example. Like, if you, if you, uh, if you like, watched his talk in Hull, I love that talk. And and the, the shots he took of uh, of his parents um, and mm -hmm. and the emotional moments he took at weddings that for me weren't necessarily the most technical photographs, but like. It, it elicits a response. I mean, we, we talk, I, I didn't actually get to go to the, 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 um, the talk, but Tom Stoddard gave the talk there as well. And the photos he took, which, which I mean, will bring you to tears, but they're not necessarily the most technical photographs. And thank goodness for that. Like someone like Don McCullen, um, most of his career, you know, they're, 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 they're photographs of important things. They're not trying to show off about how much technique he knows. That's not important. And, and I think it would get, out, get in the way in those cases, you know? So I suppose it's just balancing. It depends what you're trying to do. Like if, if you're trying to do a fashion shoot, for example, then, then technique matters. Then technique's important. It's not one or the other. It just depends where you wheel it out. Because in that case, maybe meaning isn't what it's about. Maybe finding some deep meaning is not really the important thing. You want to show off technique. You want to show visual flair. It's about aesthetics. It's about design. Go for it. Do your thing. But if you want to turn your camera and talk about something or tell a story, then, then technique might hurt you, not help you. Maybe you need to find the simplest way to tell the story and tell it as best you can. It's, 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 more it's a balance, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. But I mean, I've, I spoke to Martin Parr um, a couple, mm. of week, couple of weeks ago, and, and I made the point that I'd bump, bumped into an interview of, with Don McCullen on, on a, a program on TV about this lady with that camera. She was doing, and she asked him, "What do you think to your last fifty years of photography?" And he said, "I've wasted my time." Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know if you saw it. He asked yeah, I've heard him say similar. Yeah. 
nobody's listened. Nobody's yeah. taken anything away from it. Yeah. You know, we're still fighting each other. We're still rioting. We're still kicking off everywhere. So he said it's been a waste of time. And I thought, I wonder if that if he feels sad about that, or he actually feels relieved. I don't know actually how he'd think about well, it. It's, it's worse than that for him because I, I read his book uh, Unreasonable Behavior, his, his uh, autobiography, which was fascinating. And he he admits in that he said that my reasons for going to war zones to take photographs were not good. I was a young testosterone-filled man who, who wanted the adrenaline rush and the danger. Like it, it didn't, it didn't start by going, oh gosh, I want to change the world. It started by I want a rush, and this is a rush, and I'm, I, I can do it for a job. And you know, it slowly became, you know, you see enough of that, it's going to change you. And now, in his later years, you know, he's shooting landscapes and, mm. and you know, life around Britain and the rest of it. And and I think the sadness is, yeah, he's he's shown the rest of the world this. And no one kind of cares, and it just keeps going the same. It's, I mean, to be honest, it must. When you've seen what Don's seen, it it must be quite. It must affect you mentally. Oh yeah. Somewhere. You know, you when you're surrounded by that sort of environment, it, it can't possibly oh. be good for you. Uh, I mean, no that. knocking at all what he's done in photography because it's spellbinding. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's, you know, it's hugely, hugely historic as well. Um, but yeah, it's going to have an effect on him. And Martin. The other day said, no, there's absolutely no way would he want to go to a conflict zone. No way. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm with him on that one as well. Absolutely. I don't, I don't, I don't have that constitution, man. Uh, <laughs> so your street photography, I mean, you, there's so much we could talk about, and I'm just conscious of the clock as well, because time's flying. I mean, YouTube, Instagram, uh, and how you've managed to build that audience up and, and things like that, you know, that's quite fascinating. Which one came first, Instagram or YouTube? Um, Instagram, I was on Instagram for a while, but I didn't really, I didn't really do anything with it or take it very seriously. I just posted every now and again, cause I just, you know, enjoyed it. Um, but I, uh, I, I think what YouTube came first as a, as a deliberate thing. And I, I started that in, well, 2015, I put out three videos and this kind of links back to the fact that I used to speak in churches every week. That was my job. And I really enjoyed putting together a talk and I got a massive kick out of inspiring people to live better lives somehow. Like I love doing that. And when I left, I had this hole in my life. I built something which I was good at that I couldn't do anymore. And so I had this sort of five year, six year break where I did nothing. And then I thought, I wonder if now that I've learned a lot of photography, I could, I could maybe dip back in on something like YouTube and mix in, um, you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing with photography, but also start talking about things I care about. So I did this series of product videos. So at the time I was shooting big products. And when I, when I started doing that, I went onto YouTube to look for tutorials on how to shoot a sofa in a studio. And no one was doing it. Everyone had tutorials on like tabletop product photography, small product photography, but nothing that big or dealing with like reflective surfaces or shiny leather or, or changing the color of fabrics, like the gritty stuff of product photography. So I thought I'll do this three part series, which I put out and it did all right, got passed around. And because I think there was that hole for knowledge, but I didn't like the videos. They're still on my channel, but I'm like, this is not what I want to do mm. because it's dry tutorials and I don't, I don't care about it. So I, I kind of left it like everyone does. You start a YouTube channel and three videos later, you've abandoned it already. <laughs> and then that was January, 2015. And then, and then in May, 2016, I, uh, I, I went to Snowdonia just on a little four day break on my own. Um, and I sort of rented this little like log cabin on the, on, on the, on the stream there in, in, um, in a valley, Ogwen Valley. And, uh, I just decided I'm going to, I'm going to try, um, landscape photography. I'm not a landscape photographer. I, I kind of know how to do it. I know technically how to do it, but I'm not very good at it. I don't have an eye for it cause it's not what I do. And I thought I need to do this because I'm falling out of love with photography because the day job is so technical and repetitive in the studio. And so I thought, That's let me just film it. Yeah, let me just film it. Let me talk to camera and say what I'm doing and how I'm not very good at this, but I'm trying something and I'm doing this because I'm trying to stay in love with photography and keep challenging myself. And that video did really well. Um, and, and it felt like what I wanted to do. Like looking back at it, I was like, I was vulnerable in that. I was honest about the fact that I'm not very good at this. I shared journey and, and progress and process and all that stuff. And I thought, this is what it needs to be. So I, I just said, I'll... I'll only do one video a month. I'm not like a YouTuber who can, you know, smash out 10 videos a month. That's craziness to me. I can't because I wanted each one to be written well and be meaningful as well. So I thought I'll do one video a month and then I just plotted away like that for a while. 
And I said in the channel trailer, right from the beginning, I said, this, this video is, these videos are going to be as much about life in general as, as photography specifically, because I care about this stuff as well. And I'm not, I'm not, I am, I am teaching photography, but it's also kind of a Trojan horse. Like I, I want to talk about things like how do you deal with your own ego as an artist? How do you deal with creative jealousy when it crops up? How do you deal with all the stuff you can't control and learn to separate from that from the stuff you can and stop being all those kind of like psychological slash philosophical slash spirituality stuff. I wanted to make that the meat of what I was doing. So, and then people came over to my Instagram to be frank from YouTube. Like I, I had a thousand, maybe 2000 followers on Instagram before YouTube. They all came over from YouTube. So I didn't grow an Instagram following because I hacked the system somehow. They all just hopped across from the channel. Yeah. I think you're um, one of the, the huge things about your, your YouTube channel is the, the honesty. It comes across. It's, it's, uh, strength. thanks. And it's not, it's, I mean, you, you have to wade through on it on YouTube. There's an awful lot of stuff on it, obviously, but to find somebody who's, not razzmatazz and this isn't meant in any way to be insulted but it's no. purposeful it's you know and i don't think you even have any music here intro do you have a little intro and chat and then you're in and it's simple and that's so refreshing it was for me when i first started to watch you, you oh know, thanks Collier. and it's just like there's nothing there's, you don't you don't spend 20 minutes of a 30 minute video selling something yeah you i know. mean when i when i was starting in photography trying to teach myself i got really discouraged by watching a lot of youtubers on, on on like photography youtubers because every video of theirs felt like a very sort of thinly veiled attempt to show off about how brilliant they thought they were and how successful they thought they were so it was a lot of like yeah i was shooting in the studio for clients this week and then i went out and like i'm, I'm so busy and i'm so you know all got all this stuff and look at all this fancy gear and then three months later they disappeared because they went bankrupt because of course they were lying and it was just a marketing exercise and I thought like, I'm never going to get caught doing a YouTube channel where I am, I'm going to undersell everything I'm doing, not oversell it. So I'm not telling you about most of what I'm doing. I'm going to be honest with you about how difficult the journey is and do the other side of it. And there was one video in particular, um, lots of you will know who this is, but Zach Arias is a, a photographer out of the States. And he made a video for Scott, Chal uh, Scott Kelby's channel. It must be like 2011. And it, it really struck home. Most of it is just, ambient shots of him driving in a car but there's a voiceover going of him saying how you know i'm running a million miles an hour and i just don't feel like i'm getting anywhere like this is really hard and that, that made such an impression on me how honest he was willing to be and and that's what i was in the church the reason i got kicked out is because i was honest about things they didn't want to talk about that's just who i am and i thought that's the target then between that so that he's shown me that it's possible to do in the photography space i used to do that with the church i'm now going to talk as honestly as possible about my journey and how difficult it all is in general and don't beat yourself up about it so mm. that's where I, it comes from. A, I was watching a, i don't know why i was watching it. inside moniker it was called um right it relates a little bit to youtube and it was about the royal family you know the the the, the royal family in monaco um but they were they had they were how they were raising money and they were having this do and it was for famous youtube people and it was <laughs> bizarre <laughs> because it was like, and, yeah. I, and I don't care to be honest, it was like the essence of bad taste. Yeah. There was guys turning up in supercars that they'd mm -hmm. wrapped in something with, and the award went for an influencer. It was, a, I think, like an influencer. That This big grand mm -hmm. ball was, was for the world's greatest influencer. And, oh, my God. I said to Michelle, I said, that's just hell. Yeah, it's mm. the last place I would ever want to be. I can't see you being there, not because cause it's just not your style, not because no, you're, no, I cringe. Not, yeah, these people, and, and honestly, the camera was panned on the audience when the winner was announced. And if you'd seen so many egos hit the floor, it must have felt like an earthquake. You know, I, I you saw the faces. Yeah. Really, in like the Oscars, when even when you lose, you've got some yeah, faces. yeah. These people weren't afraid of it. They were like. Ugh. Bloody hell, you know, and they were almost, almost on the verge of walking out. And I just thought, God, is this what the world's actually coming to? You know, is this what these superstars are now? They're just people who have millions of followers on yeah. YouTube and things. I mean, they are, though. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't like calling myself like that. I'm not, I don't want to be a 41-year-old YouTuber. It's just really awkward, embarrassing <laughs> to introduce her. I went believe, to... Uh, believe me, Sean, you don't look anything like any of oh, this one, honest to God. 
Yeah, I, I went to, uh, there's a, a YouTube space here in London, which if you, if you have a channel of a certain size or whatever, you could book the space, you can use their studio, which is kitted out with the best cameras and lights you can get. And they invited me because when you get over a certain number of subscribers, I think it was 10,000 subscribers like years ago, and you can go and have a tour of the place and you can see what you can book. And it was a particular time and I went there and, and, and I, I walked up to the YouTube space and there were a queue of 60 teenagers with just like bright shirts and like, like gamer, whatever. So it was, you could just tell it was gamers. And I just turned around and I just walked the other way because I'm like, this is not, I'm using a platform. To, to do something and it affords me the ability to kind of build an audience, which I'm really grateful for. But the YouTube culture, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not that, yeah. I mean, it doesn't fit with me at all. Yeah. I think you made a point um, when we spoke before, uh, if you want to get millions of followers, was it buy a puppy or buy a cat? Well, this is the thing with Instagram is people, <laughs> people often get hold of me on Instagram and go, well, if I posted that photograph you posted today, I'd only get 10 likes. This is unfair. And I'm like, well, the whole thing's not fair. I, I get thousands of likes because I have thousands of followers and I have thousands of followers because they came over from YouTube, but it doesn't mean that the photograph I take because it gets 10,000 likes or whatever, <clears throat> is, is 10,000 or a thousand times better than the photo you took because there are channels with, with, you know, people taking photograph of their photographs of their puppies that have millions of followers and millions of likes. It doesn't mean their photography is millions of times better than the rest of us. If you think that's what that channel, that what that platform Instagram means, you've got it all wrong. It's not a judge of good photography. It's, it's not what likes or follows mean at all. I don't deserve the followers I have. They came over from a different platform. They, they hopped over. My photography is all right. I don't think it's, I mean, I've, I've got bigger following, uh, like a bigger following than a, than, than a lot of famous photographers who've worked their whole careers. That's not fair. And it's not, it's not a judge of, it doesn't say that I'm better than them. It's social media. It does, it's, it's a lot of those numbers are vacuous. And a lot of those followers aren't really following you. They hit one follow one day and forgot about you. It's not real. It's not important. I think it's the connection you have with your followers. I mean, you, there's an interesting article, and I think, is it by Kevin Kelly? Have I got the right name? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, a thousand true fans. And that's, yeah, yeah. that's fascinating. And if, I mean, yeah. I haven't got the way of sharing a link, but people need to look that up. I mean, you shared a link on, on one of your... My latest video. Latest yeah. video yeah. about it. I mean, yeah. I think that's a fascinating analogy, the thousand fan scenario. Yeah, I mean, his basic thing is, uh, and I always had this in mind going into YouTube, I wasn't trying to get millions of followers. Um, and I don't take the big number of followers or subscribers seriously, because I, I, I know from looking at the videos, most of them don't watch my videos. So what does it matter that you subscribed? It does, you're not following along. Mm -hmm. I mean, the lowest, I judge it by the lowest number of views I get on a video in any year. And that's always the update video at the beginning of the year. This year that has 30,000 views, which isn't nothing, but I have almost 400,000 subscribers. So way less than 10% of my, my subscribers, people who, who, who say they want to follow along, are actually following. So it doesn't mean anything at all. And I, I always thought that I wanted to focus on the core of people who really cared about what you're doing at the middle because of that article. Because Kevin Kelly says, an artist of any sort, whether you're a photographer, painter, writer, doesn't matter, can potentially make a living if you build a thousand true fans, just a thousand true fans. And he defines a true fan as somebody who will who will buy your book when it comes out or come out if you give a talk or any of those kind of things. And if you can build that core, you can sustain yourself on that. And, and I've managed to do that now. So that, that big subscriber number is irrelevant to me. It's what I'm grateful for is that there are a thousand true fans within that, that, that buy a book of photography from me every year, that buy some prints every now and again, and I can pay my bills doing the work that I love. And that was always the dream. Yeah. You still love printing pictures then, images? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't do it enough, honestly, but uh, there's not a lot of new work that I've made recently that I want to print. I don't, I don't print a lot of the street stuff and put it around my home. Um, but I'm hoping to move soon. So moving and um, potentially getting my own place for the first time. I'm excited about kind of decking the place out in my own work and, and the work of, you know, some of my friends who are photographers putting their work up on the wall as well and supporting them. That's, that's quite a nice idea. There's something really special about a print. I mean, I... Yeah. My photography career started with prints, you know, film mm. prints, as I discussed earlier. And, and in a dark room, which lots of people have never had the pleasure of experience, that sheet of white mm. paper. Yeah. For a developer appearing. I think that gives you, um, you know, a, a grounding in, in having that physical thing in your hand. Yeah. 
produce it. And I still love print. I mean, I, I'm quite a specific printer in the fact that I only ever print 25 of limited edition prints of any one yep. of my images. So it, yep. and once the, there's an open run uh, of certain images, but the 25 and that's it. And I'm an artist that will, once those 25 have gone, that is the end of that picture. You know? That's great. Um, yeah, it's great. Because I think you have to, you have to be like that. You have to be honest with your with your, your clients, basically. You know, your, your public, and um, and I think that there's, that makes those twenty five so much more special. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and when you see it coming, even when it comes out of an inkjet printer, so to speak, it's not quite the same as a tray, but it's still it's still a physical pen. You choose the pen. There's so much more involved in the photography side of it because you're choosing the paper. Uh, and you're balancing the inks and things like yep. this and the, and the way it looks and it's and then you emboss it and sign it and it just makes it a very special thing so i think i do think printing is becoming more more into the forefront again now well, at least i'm hoping it is. yeah i think so i say but for photographers sakes the fact that you can you know you take a book to the pub rather than a bloody black glass screen you know yeah, I mean, it, it, I think anyone who prints for the first time, like like having a physical thing in your hand is special, you know, it's because it becomes more real. I think, I think there's nothing wrong with posting images online. And, and, you know, I don't look down on it at all. I do it all the time. But there is like another level you get to having that physical thing that you put on a wall or you hand over to somebody as a gift um, just brings it into the real world, which mm. I think is, yeah, it's, it's special. It's special. We've got a few questions flying in now. Um, yeah. From Lee. So what's your next war? So what's next for Sean? Um, your own church, the next Tiger King? <laughs> Have you any ideas or dreams of the next stage of your journey? Um, Not quite sure what the Tiger King is, but there we go. It's, a, it's an inside joke. I used to... Uh, I, used to I thought uh, it might be. <laughs> yeah, in, uh, in, uh, you've seen my leopard print pants, that's what it is. No, it's... Um, it's uh, when I was a teenager, that was what I wanted to do was rehabilitate big cats back into the wild in, in South oh, Africa. Wow. So I actually went that route for a while and, and it didn't really, it didn't pan out. But yeah, it was, it was something I tried to do for a while. I, um, think I get to tell you, that's a show on TV or something like that. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've, I've heard about yeah, it. I've it's never it's seen mad. It. You, it's <laughs> absolutely mad. Um, I mean, I'm looking to move cities. I'm trying to get out of London at the moment and move hopefully up north. And uh, that'll change everything. That'll change my photography and what I shoot, which I'm up excited to about. Up to Yorkshire. Oh, well done. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I'm excited about that change. I feel like I can always come to a city and do that sort of photography. It's, it, I know how to do that and I'll keep developing it. But it'll be trips I take on the side. I, I want to get out into a bit of space. Um, I've got a few, couple of portrait projects in mind that I want to do that I can only really do after I move that are, again, sort of connected to some of my story as well, but um, uh, yeah, w would work better in that part of the world. And um, yeah, just trying to, trying to sort of shoot um, out and about a bit more in terms of not necessarily landscape photography, because honestly, I don't see myself as a up at four in the morning with, you know, <laughs> a big backpack of cameras and filters and heavy tripods. But yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to sort of shoot some of the countryside as well in some way and do some projects around that too would be great. And then just I'll keep going with the channel, keep going with the books and, uh, you know, while it's working, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm going to, I'm going to keep going, um, while it works because tomorrow it could be gone. Who knows? But yeah, well, while it's the world we're living in it. Yeah. Um, we have another question here from Zoana. Um, if you were to give one piece of advice to a person that is new to portrait photography, what would it be? That is a good question. Um, I, I, think, I think keep it simple. Don't get, don't get uh, seduced too quickly by, by the, uh, the, the lighting and the technical stuff. I mean, you can take an award-winning image with, with a 50 mil lens and, a, and window light. So, so start, start there and shoot a lot of that, like shoot a lot of friends and a lot of family and people who are willing to do that. Find nice diffused, non-direct window light and, and just work on, you know, what does it do when you shallow your depth of field? What does it do when you open it up? How far do you want your subject away from your background to get the amount of blur? You like work out what focal length is your favorite and, and all that kind of stuff and talk to people while you're shooting with them and, and watch what moments unlock the honest moment uh, the, the response from the, the honest response because if you can do that then then that's going to 
set you in good stead because honestly you can learn the technical stuff if you put your head down and everyone presented it to you in an easy packet you could learn the technical stuff in a week but all that meaningful stuff is the stuff of a lifetime so start learning start learning um how to interact with people and elicit responses from people and catch moments with people and keep the technical stuff simple for as long as you can because i promise you chances are you're going to come back to it anyway and i think that one of the um, one of the secrets that's probably not looked at the great about some of the greatest portrait photographers is not so much the technical ability yeah they are as people yes absolutely that's, that's immensely portrait uh, important for a portrait yeah. photographer because you you've got to communicate you, know, you don't communicate with the landscape. You sit on the side of a hill somewhere in the middle of winter or four o'clock in the morning, like you said, not disrespecting yeah. landscape photography because that's a no. dedication completely. Mm. Um, but with the portrait photography, it's not an inanimate object, it's a person. So you have to communicate and delve into that person to, to shoot. I mean, I shot a portrait of a, uh, of a gentleman who, you know, I took 29 frames and then spent four hours talking to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it was just fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, his history of his life through yeah. the, the the war and all that. I was just mesmerized by his, by the chat. You know, the camera almost became forgotten mm -hmm. about, you know, let's just have a cup of tea and chat. And that was, that's what I love about portrait photography, is finding out who people actually are. And I, I, I think that's important though, because like the best portrait photographers are genuinely inquisitive and interested in people. And I think that's something to nurture as well, if you want to be a good mm. photographer. A question from Nigel, of all the work you have done, which would you do if you could only do one for the rest of your life? So one subject for the rest of your life. Por you? Portrait photography, yeah. Portrait. It, would be, it would be portraits, yeah. Um, we've got another question here. I don't know if we've covered this one. Uh, how are you finding the change from DSLR to Sony mirrorless? I saw a video of you switching out and wondered how you were getting on after a year or so. Uh, I'm debating the same thing at the moment. Thanks for all your great work, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't recommend cameras to people ever because I think everyone's needs are very different. But my experience was I, I had built up three sets of kit. I had the, the two 5D Mark IIs for the studio stuff and a set of lenses with those. I had a Canon 80D for video stuff because the, uh, the, or, the face autofocus and the flip screen. And I had three lenses for that for video. And then I had Fuji cameras. I had the X-T20 at the time and a set of lenses for street stuff, which is just ridiculous. Three bags of stuff. So my goal was to get everything down to the smallest amount of kit in one bag that I could travel with and do all of those things without sacrificing quality. And the obvious choice when I looked at the specs for the things I needed and that were important to me was Sony. Mm. And I haven't regretted it at all. I mean, it's, they, they are, they, they're not, I, I don't love Sony cameras like I like holding a Fuji camera. They're not romantic cameras, they're plastic boxes. But the image quality out of them for me is undeniable. Um, people moan about the color science. I, it, they are my favorite colors to work with because I don't, I don't rely on the camera to give me my color science. I, I, don't, I, I do my own color work. So I want a flat and neutral starting point that I can put my own color work into. Um, and the Sonys for me are the most accurate flat colors out of camera of any camera I've, I've used. I found the Fujis, if, if you don't like doing your own color work, then, then letting the camera choose your color science for you is important um so but i found i'd have to work the cat the, the canon images i'd have to work them back to something flatter or more neutral to work them forwards into my color afterwards and i i, I just i got a bit tired of doing that so for for those reasons yeah i mean i i'm no plans to move they are they're fantastic cameras for my use case of being a hybrid shooter equal photography and video in yeah. one small package is is great. Yeah, I have no I, I have no regrets of, of swapping over systems mm. as well. Um, yeah. I don't know if we'll get through all these questions, but we'll have a go. How did you realize that the creative path you followed made sense with your life point of view? That's an interesting one. Well, it's like what you said a minute ago that that you know the, the best portrait photographers it comes out of who they are. I think the work of finding out your style or, or what you want to say comes from paying attention to who you are and how you're wired. So, I mean, I, I, I recommend to people um, things like do a personality test as, as naff as they are. I mean, I, like I, the one I love is the Enneagram. Do, do the Enneagram, do, do that personality test and uh, work out who you are. Like, look at how people interact with you, work out what things are important to you. How, how are you wired? Like, I know 
I'm a type one on the Enneagram, for example. So I am very, or what is it, INFJ, if you do the, the, the Myers-Briggs stuff. I, I know that um, right and wrong is very important to me as a personality type. I'm a perfectionist. So I like things to be a particular way that, that I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to sort of see order in the world and pull it towards order. I, I, I like to talk about things when they're wrong. I'm, I'm someone who points up. I know all those things about myself as a, as a personality. And so because I know that, um, then that gets fed into what I do because I'm paying attention to where it connects. So a, a very silly example is um, a, lot, a lot of people will tell you like what I do on Instagram isn't really street photography, which, which I'm, I'm, I, I would accept. I'm fine with that. It doesn't fit a particularly traditional concept of street photography. So Martin mm. Parr might look at my stuff and say it's not really street photography. Um, and that's fine. That's okay. Cause it's, it is whatever it is. I don't need a label on it. It doesn't matter to me, but I try to work out then why was I shooting single individuals walking through graphical light and shadow? Cause that's what I usually shoot. And I realized when I took a look at myself, what that was, it was that when I come, when I came to London, I'm an introvert. So I, I I'm, I'm a shy personality type and a big city like London can be quite intimidating. Um, I don't, I don't go to pubs and get pissed. It's not my personality type. I, I don't like soccer. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't hang out with people the way people hang out. So I've always felt a little bit outside. And when I'm walking around London, I'm often walking on my own and reading a book in a coffee shop or something quiet like that. I'm that quiet a personality type walking around. And I realize that I'm shooting myself in essence. I'm, 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 I'm almost talking about my personality and how I experience a city by shooting other people in the way that they're moving around. So that's an example of, because I know me, I'm able to see why I shoot in a particular style and what I'm trying to say with it. But it starts with knowing yourself, being honest about who you are, good and bad. Um, another tip, uh, question here. Do you have any tips for a documentary project? I have an idea for a project, but I don't know where to put the work out. I don't want to do it only for Instagram or my website only. But that's maybe doing a project and knowing where to, to market, not market it, but to promote yeah. it. I think that means. I mean, on, honestly, uh, I, 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 the, the answer is I don't know because I've never managed to do that. I've never managed to shoot a documentary project and put it out on a platform where other people pay attention to it. I, I've just put it out on my own platform and I'm lucky that I've built that platform. So it's the same question I get with people who sort of go, um, oh yeah, I want to sell prints from my website. I'm going to put lots of prints on my website. And so well, do people visit your website? Mm. They're like, well, not really. And they get upset because no one's buying their prints. It's like, but no one knows you're there or what you're doing. So they're almost two separate questions, I think, and separate them out. The first is how do you do a portrait project? And that is find a story that you are genuinely interested in and, and, and better distill it down to a question you want to ask. So, um, I don't know. Let's, like, like, what about um, Peter Dench's project on alcohol in England? So he obviously has a question about like, how do, how do the English treat alcohol? You know, and he's, he's got an idea because he's seen it. Yeah, he's got an idea. I've got the book. It. Yeah, I've got, I've yeah. got the book. Yeah, it's fantastic. There book. you go. And then he goes, he takes time, he takes a chunk of time and he goes, he goes, to, he goes to clubs, he hangs out long hours, he puts himself in uncomfortable situations and he just waits and he watches. And, and it's a good idea not to go with too tight a mood board either because you want to catch the happy accidents. You don't want to be too funneled in your focus. Um, and then just spend time with it, shoot a lot, get back and, and work out and, and even take some space and then look at it and work out what you've got and what's good. And then the sequencing becomes very important. What image you show after what image and what story unfolds mm. from that. And that won't necessarily be the image you shot it. And it will almost certainly not be the way you preconceived it. But portrait, like documentary projects are very messy things and they have to be because otherwise you're not, tell, you're not giving a documentary, you're making a feature film. You're telling a story you want to tell instead of going to uncover a story that you let unfold. So that's the one half. And then it, how to promote it, I, I honestly don't know. I think it's mm. harder than ever to get people to pay attention to it. I mean, you could try, if it's something you think the media would be interested in, to send it to, to, to newspapers and magazines, say, look, I shot this project, I've written some stuff around it, would you be interested in featuring it? That's sometimes worth it, it's hard to get in. But uh, if you, depending on the project, I mean, my first line of thought would be, if you're shooting a project, say, of a, I mean, I was a member of the Lifeboat for, for seven years, so I did a, mm -hmm. a, a project called a Black and White Year of Haunts Your Rescue. 
Right, um, cool, because it great. was all in black and white. It was from cups of tea upwards, you know. I also right. did a project where I, I documented the the building of the last two Yorkshire wooden cobbles, um, because the guys who build them, built them, won't be building anymore, and there's nobody to follow them on. And I yeah. had lapse cameras set up and all that. The first yeah. I went was shot in Bridlington, was into the Bridlington Cobble Museum. Right, a place for it, you know. Yeah, um, I don't think the film's ever been released, to be honest, but it's quite. It's quite entertaining on many many things and and, mm. and historic, you know. So the local yeah. area was where it was. So that would probably be my first line of thought to to, to promote it would be to where it where you shot it, you know. A um, couple more questions. If you, are you still are you okay? Shall I'm I? good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yeah keep going. Um, how do you compare photography with videographers? Do you think that still photographers can benefit from getting into videography in uh, in their journey? Um, there's a, there's a lot of crossover and there's a lot of differences is the mm. short answer. Like, I mean, I started in video and moved to photography. Um, I think it's, I think I, I would guess it's easier to start with photography and move to video from the way I did it. Uh, in that, I mean, things that are common are things like, um, uh, framing and composition and, uh, learning about what your ISO shutter speed aperture does and what focal lengths do and what depth of field does. All those things are common from one to the other. Um, the extra elements you're going to have to think about when it comes to video is, is things move. So, so you can't just compose a static shot. If someone's going to walk through a scene, that composition has to work at every still frame. So you're, you're almost composing the background and having a path for that person to walk through the work. So you, you, you've, you've just got to add that time element to it. And then you've got things like not just do your subjects move, but does your camera move? So, so, do I want to slide this shot? Do I want to push in on this shot? Do I want it locked off on a tripod? Do I want a slightly handheld feel because that communicates something? Then of course you've got audio. Audio is half a video. Like don't, don't mistake that. Like you have to work on audio as well. So, I mean, um, Philip Bloom, who a lot of you will know, I'm sure put out this amazing like pie chart, which couldn't be more accurate with a tiny sort of blue slice in it that was just uh, time it takes to, to cut your timeline. And then the other 95% of it was all in red. And it says time it takes to choose the music track for your video. And he's 100% right. Because I can agree with that one. Even music though. is everything. Absolutely yeah. everything. It sets the tone for what you do. Like I, I spend a long time picking the right music. And I've now gone back and bought myself a MIDI keyboard. And I'm playing my own music into my videos now. Because I want as much control over it as I can. In terms of creating that ambient space and the right feel. So... It's, it's, it's all those extra elements and obviously then cutting on timelines and, and putting together a sequence that tells a story, which is similar to the documentary if you were shooting a documentary project. But I think when most people think photography, they think of the single image. So you really have to start thinking in sequences. So it's, it's definitely more complicated. There's a lot more to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, having a go, having, like all that sounds intimidating, having a go with it and making a mess of it, you'll still learn a lot. And honestly, I get more inspiration from my photography from films than I do from other photographers, because I think cinematographers are a lot braver than photographers often. Um, I, I mentioned a movie recently on a video called Road to Perdition, which is an amazing, it was Conrad Hall's uh, last film as DOP before he died in 2002, he won the Oscar for it posthumously. He, and it's, it's one of those films which you can hit pause at any moment in that film and it's a beautiful still, absolutely beautiful. And, and film, you'll find as well that cinematographers are a lot braver in how they play with color. Like they're not as obsessed with correct skin tone, for example. They'll push colors quite hard often to, to different things, to, to convey different things, which I think photographers, like me, I'm very careful with skin tones in portraits, but it, it's sort of pushing me to be braver. So I think you can learn a lot from cinema either way. And yes, giving it a go yourself will probably teach you a lot moving over mm. to video, yeah. There's one last one here. Uh, I think we've probably covered quite a bit of this maybe, but uh, could you describe your journey development in that, if that was needed, to the self-reflected and awesome personality, personality <laughs> you are today? That's, oh, that's, that that's, one, very, that's very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I don't accept the premise. Let's start there. But like, yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> I, uh, thank you. Um, I'll stump I, you I mean, a bit. <laughs> I, 
I think I know why you're saying that. I think, I think I th because I'm also, I'm self-aware enough without hopefully being egotistical about it to know that I, when I connect with people, I connect with people because I'm willing to be, I'm a fairly clear thinker. I can communicate fairly well. And I think, I think I'm willing to be very honest about my own mistakes. And I think that helps people have a, a feeling of safety in numbers. And, and I think some, something I've realized or increasingly realize is, is that every single piece of your journey like, uh, like adds up to who you are. So the fact that my parents were divorced young and I grew up without a dad is part of it. The fact that I, that drew me into the church because I was looking for father figures is part of it. The fact that then that didn't work uh, because I, I got a conscience about certain things but also that there was amazing stuff I picked out of all these things, getting mentors who, who, who helped me and taught me, learning to be introspective and hard on myself in particular ways in the church, and then hopefully turning to something more healthy afterwards. Um, and the stuff that I choose to read now, uh, all those things add into who you are. And I, and I reckon like, I reckon it's something that if we're not careful because we're on photography forums trying to find what the next best lens is, that, we can forget that working on ourselves is way more important than finding money to buy a super fancy lens because who you are will come out in what you do. So, so taking the time to really, um, to work on yourself, be, be as self-aware as possible, uh, and, and willing to call yourself out on your mistakes and your, 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 your blind sides and the ugly parts of yourself will, will can only make you a better person if you do it right. I think, so that's like, if, if, if there's any good in what I do, that's where it comes from. Is, is that, is that, and lots of that journey wasn't my choice, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it was bad stuff, but good stuff came out of it. And some of it was my choice and I'm glad I did that. And, and we all do that in our different ways. You know? I think picking up, taking positives out of negatives is always a great way to move, isn't it? Mm. You know, just don't dwell on them. Uh, I mean, it's just yeah. diversifying from that question slightly. Uh, I get when I mention people that, you know, um, how do you develop a style? And, and uh, I always say your style's already inside you. You just yeah. know how to get it out. Absolutely. Um, there's lots of tips. Well, Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Um, you it too. It really man. has. Yeah, it's been lovely. And, uh, good luck on your move up to God's own country. Thank you. Uh, and, <laughs> I'll see you there uh, soon. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Hopefully we'll catch up and have a, a coffee or a beer or whatever. Um, Sounds but, great. If you're not a pub man, then we'll probably have a coffee. Uh, but oh, another another room with a pub. I could do a cheeky G and T every now and again, but I'm not. Really oh, well, we'll have one of those. Then. But good, and it's been it's been great, and I think everybody's there's some fantastic comments in the chat and um, and some great. lovely lovely messages. We've had some great questions. Thanks ever so much. I don't know if Becky's still there. I think she maybe is. Just I am. Um, I'm still knocking around. Um, yes, just gonna say, just gonna second what Gavin's saying. Thank you so much. What a fantastic session. Great. Um, Thank so you. So many lovely compliments being thrown your way. Um, it's been absolutely spellbinding to hear you and hear your story and see your images. Um, so thank can't you. Have enough. Um, I've shared your links around. So I hope you're going to get lots more followers. If you aren't already following guys, please do. Um, if you've got a free afternoon, just tune in to Sean's channel and you will not regret it. I promise you. Um, thank you. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Gavin. A great session again. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely day and okay. look forward to seeing you soon. Cool. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.